Cardinals Rewind. Here, week five edition. I'm Stephen McCollum, of course. This main event special podcast that I do here. Breaking down the Cardinals game the week before. Looking forward to the week this the game this week, if I can learn to speak. Which is hard to do <laughs> when you're doing something like this. But we'll get our hands around it and everything. So, of course, guys, as we all know, Cardinals went to Carolina. They left with a 2-2 two and two record. Lots of questions after a 31-21 loss to the Carolina Panthers last Sunday morning. Tough start for the Cardinals. Tough game for the Cardinals. We'll get into a little bit more. We try not to get too negative on this show. Uh, we try not to get outlandish. We try to stick to the facts and what we see uh, and what the Cardinals do. And what we notice, uh, just as a true Cardinals fans going into uh, you know these games. And this game, overall, the easiest word to sum it up with is huge disappointment. Cardinals left an opportunity to uh, have a victory by not showing up in the first quarter. Lack of tackling. We'll get into all that here in just a little bit. And unfortunately, we have to be a little negative on this show because it was so bad, disappointingly bad for the Cardinals. So on my game notes I took during the game, shockingly enough, I did not take that many. I was just disgusted with what I saw, I guess is a good word. No point in time did I think the Cardinals were ever going to wake up in this game, was ever going to come back. And the more I watched it, it just the more depressing you got watching these guys out there performing, especially on the defensive side. And I came to the realization about one and a half quarters in that this defense has serious issues in that game. And we'll get into why I think a little bit here coming up uh, in a little bit as well. So, but for my game notes, I had repeatedly written down poor tackling, missed tackling, awful tackling. That's my favorite one. Teddy Bridgewater ran all over the place. Davis ran all over the place for the Panthers. Uh, Robbie Anderson uh, catching balls left and right for the Panthers. Awful. Yards after catch. Yards running. Lots of single. Panthers had the ball forever in this game. And we'll get into that as well coming up as well. That's just my game notes. Um, slow start. I wrote, actually, I wrote this halfway through the first quarter. I didn't even wait till the end of the first quarter. You could see another slow start for the Cardinals. They didn't get the benefit of the slow start and special teams making a big play like they did in the 49ers game in week one. They were down 14 and nothing in the first quarter and Panthers were having the way with the Cardinals early in this game. Set the tone early. My last one I wrote, I wrote this one in the third quarter, about 10 minutes to go in the third quarter. And I'll just say what I wrote down. Cards defense is lost. And I put everyone. <laughs> I don't know what play I saw that I made me write everyone after that. I don't know what I don't remember. Secondary was badly ravaged, right? With injuries. There's no pass rush on this defense. And we'll dig into that a little bit here uh, with just some stats uh, that the Panthers came away with this game with that, quite frankly, is just unacceptable for this Cardinals defense uh, in this game. So positives. Let's talk some positives. There's not many of them, so let's talk about them. I mean, positives are they came out relatively healthy compared to how they went in. Always a positive. Uh, they've been ravaged with injuries, especially in the second in the secondary. You know, uh, Buda Baker was out. Banjo was out. Starting safeties uh, were out of this game. Kennard was out, which we'll talk about how I thought that affected the game. A lot more, a lot of talk about the safeties with Banjo being out and Buda Baker being out. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, an X factor that I didn't hear a lot of people talking about this week that I thought really affected the game there as well uh, when we get to uh, the defensive side and we start breaking that down. Uh, but positives, Patrick Peterson's first interception on the year. Uh, those of you that followed me last year, uh, I don't think I've said it yet this year. I'm a big Patrick Peterson fan when he's able to play well. He's definitely lost a step. He cannot, he does not have the closing speed he had before. I still think he's a really serviceable uh, cornerback out there. But it was good to see him get out there. But I also think, I'll finish that thought, I also think the Cardinals need to move on from him. He's not worth the money he's being paid. And 
you know, they should be looking for a backup. But the problem is they can't find somebody on the other side of him. Drake Kirkpatrick's there this year. He's, he's definitely an upgrade compared to what they've had. But they can't find somebody to, re, to fill in on the other side of Patrick Peterson. So how are they going to fill in the Patrick Peterson role if he was able to go away? And that's the issue I have with that position and my thought process on that position. But Patrick Peterson had his first interception on the year, which is great. It was great. The, I love the way this play call happened. Patrick Peterson usually covers the receiver. He's the cornerback. Uh, he plays in the zone and does an area. They moved him basically into like a safety position. And Teddy Bridgewater was surprised he was even there. Threw the ball. Patrick Peterson got it, of course. Uh, got his first interception. I love this deception by the coaching staff. Putting Patrick Peterson into other roles that never seen before. Or at least Teddy Bridgewater I hadn't seen before on film. And he threw the ball right to him. I thought it was a beautiful play call. It was impressive. Confused Bridgewater. Uh, and he got the interception. Uh, next positive. There's a negative to go with this that I'll include with this. Uh, even though we're doing positives right now. No interceptions for Kyler Murray. So he had three the week before against the Lions. Uh, he had one in each of the first two games. And no interceptions this time. No no bad throws in terms of getting it turned over. Uh, you know, no, he did he did throw over overthrow a few receivers again. Um, not looking toward Larry. Definitely favored D Hop out there compared to the other guys. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit. But no interceptions. Great stat for him to rebound, at least on that side. However, he did have a fumble loss, which was the first time we've seen that uh, from Kyler Murray this year. So he didn't give up the interceptions, but he did fumble the ball and, of course, lost it, which did lead to a Carolina touchdown. I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe that was in the third quarter. Let me, yep, it was in the third quarter for the Cardinals. Their first drive of the third quarter, eight plays, 48 yards, um, they had a 25 yard pass Kyler Murray to Arnold, the tight end, uh, and during this drive there, and then it goes up there, no huddle. Um, basically Kyler Murray's pass, they ruled it incomplete on the field, uh, to Arnold Carolina challenged the incomplete pass ruling and the play was reversed. Uh, so, um, then Kyler Murray was sacked again with the no huddle. Uh, Kyler Murray was sacked at the Carolina 44 for minus six yards. He fumbled the ball there, recovered by Carolina at the Carolina 26 there. So, again, just disappointing how that whole play uh, area went down, that no huddle offense, which they try to get do to get the momentum there. Uh, obviously, nothing to worry about as of now. It's first one in terms of a fumble, no interceptions. I'm, I'm happy to see the no interceptions even uh, with that fumble there. Um, it's not a trend at this point in time, so I'm not going to complain about it. Um, defense, another positive that I love to see. We've talked about it before and some other ones because I love to see this. Defense got an interception in the second quarter off of Teddy Bridgewater. The offense gets the ball, goes out onto the field. They go down and they score a touchdown off of the turnover. I love points after turnover. Absolutely love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, I can't describe how much I love it. And obviously, you want touchdowns afterwards. You, I can settle for field goals if I need to. But those are gifts from the other team. As I mentioned earlier, Carolina did get the fumble recovery. They went down and scored a touchdown. It's gonna. It's a momentum killer. It's a dagger into the other team when you give the ball to them. Uh, you know, they basically don't earn it. They're not able to stop you. You make the mistake, you turn the ball over, and then you go down and score. And I love, love, love that uh, occurred here. Always something that I love to see in a game. And I made that note also in my game notes uh, when that happened because I just can't stress enough how important I think that is. There's nothing more demoralizing for an offense or, or even a defense when you get the turnover and you don't do anything with the ball. Even if it's not a long drive, you don't get points out of it. That's why those turnovers are important. Now let's get to some negatives. There are tons of them. We're going to focus on a few of them because I'm not going to do an hour of negativity on the Cardinals. There's local radio stations you can listen to uh, in the morning that you can you can have negativity all day long about the Cardinals and how bad they are and how they're not very good and all. You can go to those guys for that stuff. I like to look at the sport and the game itself and break it down 
Yes, we can be negative when we need to be and point out this stuff, but we're not going to be overtly negative and just say things for hot takes here as much as possible, as much as we can. So, again, as I said, uh, first one was the fumble uh, for Murray and lost it. This negative is huge, and this needs to be fixed. This is unexcusable. Your football team, you have one job as a defense, and that is to make tackles. Tackling was absolutely atrocious. Zero pass rush on the uh for the uh excuse me uh for the cardinals and one thing that i did notice on here was you know wasn't a lot of talk at least the local media that i heard or even on twitter or whatnot a lot of the talk was about the safeties being out the safety performance and how atrocious that was for the defense and I know Riley got uh, cut after the game. They since brought him back again. But I know he got cut and all the blame kind of went to him. But I think Devin Kennard not being in that defensive front line really affected that front line where they had zero pass rush on uh, Teddy Bridgewater. And not only that, they didn't even contain him. He was able to run the ball and get outside and run it. Check out this stat for the Panthers. The Panthers did not allow a sack in a game for the first time since week eight of 2018 so two years ago almost just short of two years ago was the last time they did not allow a sack and the cardinals did not get in there and get a sack on teddy bridgewater um at all and then on top of that as we talk about it uh, as we're talking about that on the defensive side for the cardinals right um teddy bridgewater had a, had a great game. They kept saying on the broadcast, Teddy Bridgewater hasn't run this well since his injury uh, when he was with Minnesota. 26 for 37, passing, 276 yards, two touchdowns, one interception passing the ball, but running it, six carries, 32 yards, one touchdown. His his running, it was like, it was like watching the Cardinals offense the first two weeks being done to the Cardinals defense by Carolina over the weekend. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater could pretty much pick the defense apart. He could run it if he needed to. I know it's not huge yards, but he did have a lot of big plays, actually, uh, that did get to uh, the Cardinals' defense and extend drives uh, for Teddy Bridgewater there uh, throughout the game. You know, can that have a lot to do with... I know, I, I know I'm know. i attributing the pass rush issues to Kennard because you're able to spread the... Uh, you know, you're not able to double team. You're able to double team then other guys on that defensive line to keep them from getting to him a little easier when you're missing a big playmaker like Kennard. I just didn't hear a lot of people talking about it uh, out there. And, you know, the base, the defense didn't show up at any point in this game. It's It was so bad. Now, it wasn't as bad as the week before against the Lions. But, of course... My biggest pet peeve is a lot of you know that follow me that I do not like people calling for coaches' heads after a bad game or two when you look at it overall. And this team didn't quit. They were just they were just out class. They were out performed. They were missing talent. And it just came together in this game. Every team has a game like this throughout the year where they just look like they can't do anything. So hopefully this is the one for the Cardinals. But fans are calling for Vance Joseph to be fired. I'm willing to let him get some players back this week. Booter Baker's back this week. Uh, Banjo's been practicing. I don't know if he's going to actually play yet. We haven't heard. Uh, Kennard has been ruled out for this week, I do believe, against the Jets. So we're missing that spot again. Uh, there, I'd like to see some pass rush get in there to the Jets' offensive line. And we'll talk about that as we get to the next week's preview. But we need to see some improvement quickly on this defense, even with these injuries, to where that's your bad game. That's your really bad game. Now get it back to where it was and go. Because there's still a top-ranked defense. Uh, the Cardinals are still a top-ranked defense in the league. Uh, they are. They were, I believe, eighth going into the last couple of weeks. I can't remember if it was last week or the week before. They have slipped to 14th on defense. So they are going the wrong direction. But they did have a really bad game last week and a decently bad game against the Lions the week before. Other negatives, long drives were given to the Packers. The Cardinals could not stop them at all. Davis, the running back for Panthers, huge day on the ground. Bridgewater, big day on the ground, but also in the air. And Robbie Anderson out there getting, uh, you know, moving around, getting yards. I mean, there's no, 
going into this game, very few playmakers. You can name very few playmakers on the Panthers uh, offense, and they went in there and just made the Cardinals look silly. Mike, uh, Mike Davis, the running back, as I mentioned, 16 carries, 84 yards, one touchdown. Teddy Bridgewater had that six for 32 for one touchdown. Uh, Reggie Bonifant, exactly. Who? 10 carries, 53 yards for the Panthers. Robbie Anderson, I said, had a great day. Eight receptions, 99 yards uh, off of 11 targets. Curtis Samuel, three for 51. DJ Moore, four for 49. Mark Davis did uh, get a couple catches, five for 27 out of the backfield. And there was just no stopping him. Check out these. We talk about the Cardinals drives a lot, uh, how many plays they are. And we talk about time of possession as we go through these things. And Cardinals defense is... Uh, I, I wish I had a category. We do the positives and negatives. I wish we had a category. Whatever's worse than negative. I don't even know what that is off the top of my head, but we need that category for this performance by this defense. First drive, 13 plays for the Panthers um, and, and resulted in a touchdown. Nine, second one, nine plays for the Panthers, uh, 80 yards. Oh, so listen to this. Not only that, 13 plays, 80 yards is the first one where it results in a touchdown for the Panthers, 544. Nine plays, 80 yards is their second drive. Four minutes, 31 seconds, makes it 14 to nothing. Second quarter is where they throw that interception. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater does. So basically two plays and then an interception. They get Cardinals go down to score. Panthers get the ball back. Touchdown uh, off of 10 plays, 75 yards. Five minutes, 31 seconds, makes it 21 to seven. Catching a theme on here, end of the half. Thank God it was the end of the half. Because the Cardinals, uh, they only got one play on. The Panthers only got one play for negative one yards in 35 seconds. So thank goodness the end of the half came. All right. Third quarter, only four play. Cardinals defense stopped them right off the bat. Four plays, 21 yards, minute 31. That's where then the fumble occurred uh, after eight plays, 48 yards. And then the Panthers go eight yards, eight plays, 61 yards, four minutes, 19 seconds. Touchdown, 28 to seven Panthers. Cardinals get the ball back. Panthers get the ball back after a Cardinals touchdown there. 15 plays, 78 yards, leading to a field goal. Eight minutes, 30 seconds off the clock. 31-14 Panthers. After the fourth quarter, Cardinals had a better fourth quarter than they did last week. However, on the Panthers, they had eight plays, 39 yards after the Cardinals punted after three plays to begin the fourth quarter. Missed field goal by the Panthers. So you can, and then to end the game, four plays, nine yards, two minutes, 13 seconds. Panthers just run out the clock. If you notice the trend there, Cardinals defense could not get off the field. Long, long, very, a lot of plays, a lot of yards given up, and a lot of time in the Panthers' hands. So much so, we talk about time of possessions on this podcast because I, I really think it's an indicator of how the game goes. It doesn't mean we see lots of games where one team has the ball. 10 minutes more than the other team and the team that has the ball 10 minutes more wins the game uh, has the ball 10 minutes less wins the game it's not a stat that you look at for that but in indications it does indicate in situations like this how bad you're being dominated and the cardinals were dominated and i just gave you the amount of plays and yards that the panthers had in this game for their drives they had the ball for 37 minutes and 8 seconds this entire game they almost had it for half the game, right? I mean, Cardinals had it for 22 minutes and 52 seconds. You're not going to do anything in a game when your defense is out there for that long, for that many plays, giving up that many yardage was that much time. You're just, you're just primed to get beat. Absolutely. You can't get them off the field. And that's why I have the defense uh, as a negative for last week. You guys watch the game. You guys know what we all experienced there. Uh, it's just, did a total disappointment on that side of the ball. And that's why that's why on the Vance Joseph thing, I I I'm not a normally I'm like, ah, it's too early to I'm not saying you fire the guy. Like I'm not jumping on that bandwagon by any stretch. But I get why there's a conversation. A lot of times I can kind of justify it off by saying, oh, fans are just being emotional, et cetera, et cetera. I get it. And there's nothing else we can say. This was an atrocious defensive stand. I just gave you a bunch of uh, reasons why. It needs to step up this week, especially because it's the New York Jets uh, they're playing. The other disappointment is lack of running game. Again, we talk on here the last couple of weeks how we'd like to see the running game some more. 
First couple of weeks, we saw a lot of running games where it was just Kyler Murray running the ball, especially in the first part. Then when the Cardinals got the lead to finish the game, they were able to give the ball to Kenyon Drake and players like that to get and dominate the game to take down the clock. Non-existent running game in this one. Kenyon Drake, 13 carries, 35 yards. The leader, of course, was Kyler Murray. He did get back out running a little bit this week. Six carries, 78 yards for Kyler Murray uh, in this game. Next person had the 35. That's Kenya Drake, 13 for 35. Chase Edmonds, 4 for 16. This is going to be apparently one of those years where we have to discuss every game is going to be more running game, more running game. I get it. You got DeAndre Hopkins out there. You've got all these other things going on. More running game. Give your defense a rest, right? Uh, after these long drives when they can't get the other team off the field. Get some long drives put together. Again, uh, we'll talk about it again here. Cardinals on offense, five plays, 12 yards, minute 55, punt the ball, first quarter. Second drive, three plays, seven yards, minute 21, punt. Uh, next drive, first quarter, five plays, 15 yards, two minutes, eight seconds, punt. Noticing a trend here? After the interception, 10 plays, 36 yards, but they did take 532 off the clock. That is a good drive after that interception. Fantastic. And it did put them back 14-7 to into this game. Great drive on that one, right? But then they get the ball back after a Carolina touchdown. Seven plays, 24 yards, minute 20. This defense barely catching their breath after those long Panther drives. And the they have to go right back out there again for another long drive. Uh, there's a reason why the defense looks so bad, especially in the second half. They're exhausted, right? Third quarter. Uh, after a Carolina punt, Cardinals, eight plays, 48 yards, 344. That's that fumble play, right? Uh, next time they get the ball back after the uh, Carolina touchdown, uh, seven plays, 75 yards, four minutes, 11 seconds. That's the touchdown there. Great, great drive finally. Even though it's only seven plays, 75 yards, they only took 11, four minutes off the clock because they have such big plays that happen. 48-yard run. Kyler Murray, uh, right off the bat, Kyler Murray scrambled left end to the Carolina 27 for the 48-yard scramble. Uh, so that was a big yard. Then after that, so they get the big they get the big run from Kyler Murray right off the bat on first and 10 on this drive. Here's, the, here's their plays after that. Two-yard run, eight-yard run, negative three-yard pass, 13-yard pass, four-yard run, and then the touchdown. Uh, the touchdown was for three yards. You guys notice a trend there? It's like one explosive play and then just a lot of dinky and dunk small stuff after that uh, on this drive that they have there, right? Uh, on the, uh, we'll just take a random, well, we'll finish this up. Fourth quarter, three plays, one yard, Cardinals punt, 49 seconds off the clock. That's how they begin the fourth quarter. Three plays, one yard, 49 seconds off the clock. Panthers take a drive, miss that field goal. Cardinals have seven plays, 44 yards, minute 52 off the clock. Now, of course, now they're trying to hurry because they're behind in this game, 31 to 17. They take this seven plays, 44 yards, minute 52. They get the touchdown. Panthers don't give the ball back to them. Let's do, let's do this. Let's just take a random, this is off the top of my head, so hopefully this works. We're going to take a random punt at the end of the first quarter. Five plays, 15 yards. Uh, for the Cardinals. I'm just curious what kind of play calls they ran here. Seven yard run, seven yard pass, negative three yard pass, pass incomplete, four yard run, and then they punted it. Okay. I know I know this is the second week where Cliff has taken some heat for his play calling, and he addressed it this week, saying his play calling does have to get better. And this is the second week he's had to do that. And you know, I haven't delved too much into that. I, I know I complained about it being too cute earlier in the season where he was trying to impress people and it just got stagnant, but there's no runs involved here, right? So uh, first drive of the game, let's just go with that because this is the one where they've talked about it. They planned for this drive, everything. Nine yard run, Kenyon Drake uh, right off the bat. One yard run, Kevin Drake uh, for the second play. Then an incomplete pass on first down. Uh, two yard pass. Then a pass incomplete, and then they punted it. It's not an innovative uh, offensive system at all. And they got a nine-yard run right off the bat. Then a one-yard run to get the first down right off the thing there. The next uh, three plays, one, two incompletes and a two-yard pass. Uh, so they have to punt it. Get the running game going, guys. Let's go. 
Even if it goes nowhere, establish it early. So I pound on my desk about it. I, I just scream it from the mountaintops, everybody. The play calling needs to improve by Cliff. I know a lot of people have been harping on this, and I've given him a pass. He's going to have good games. He's going to have bad games. This is two bad play calling games in a row. And now that you know, I'm digging into it a little bit more like we just did there, it's it's obvious what that the play calling isn't innovative. It isn't that great. It's the same plays. Teams learn in this league. Teams adapt. Even the worst teams like the Jets this weekend are watching the film on what the Cardinals do, and they're going to be able to figure it out. Now, can they stop? It's another story, but a good team will be able to stop it, and even a mediocre team like the Carolina Panthers and the Lions are able to stop it when you're that predictable on what you're going to do if you don't have faith in the running game. Get it going, you know? So, um, Kyler Murray this game, just really quick, 24 for 31, only 133 yards passing, but he did have the three touchdowns. So, isn't it... Isn't it you know, he ran the ball more, 78 yards. He almost had, almost, he had what? We all know math's not my strong point here uh, on the main event stuff, right? On uh, the Cardinals rewind. But was that 50 yards less running the ball than he did passing the ball as a quarterback? I just, I just don't understand it. It's just battling, baffling after two bad losses. A uh, game that they, quite frankly, should have won. Um, the Lions one, I'm willing to give it with those turnovers. That's why they lost that game for the most part. This game, they just got blown out in. It was just atrocious. It was bad. Field goal watch. We always do a field goal watch on this uh, podcast here. Well, we don't have to. Here's the good news, guys. We don't have to complain about long field goals and them not being able to drive the ball very far. They did have three short uh, touchdowns in this game. Zero field goal attempts. So, you know, that's what we get for complaining that they're leaving 50, 49, 51, 56 yard field goals for Zane Gonzalez to hit. This week they showed us by not having any. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with the Jets this weekend. You know, the, obviously they, we'd like to see a lot more 30, 35 yard field goals and these 50 yarders they have been leaving. They, of course, they have got a few in. We've detailed it in previous podcasts as they've occurred, but no field goal attempts this week. Another thing I didn't put into positives, uh, but it definitely was a positive. I don't remember any penalties that were huge penalties in this game, meaning it took them out of plays or it took killed the drives. And they only had five penalties for 29 yards. Uh, when I was looking into it, uh, obviously you guys know I watched the penalties, especially not only how many there are, but also when they occur. It's so, like you could have 12 penalties for 110 yards, but if they're in situations where, you know, you're not going anywhere. If you have a big drive and you have a penalty, a huge penalty, a 15 yard penalty, it kills the drive. But if you're going backwards and you have a penalty, you know, because you're taking losses, stuff like that, they're two different types of penalties, right? And we look into that five for 29. I didn't look them up one because I'm ecstatic. There's only five of them. I don't remember any penalty in the game that was to the point where it was cost them. Uh, was a huge indicator, stopped a drive, anything. Doesn't mean it didn't occur. It might be there, but I don't remember it. And I was ecstatic to see the five penalties for only 29 yards in this game after some big penalty weeks the last couple weeks there. Here's the other thing is that I don't put a lot of weight uh, into rankings and things like that. But I do at NFL.com, they do every week a quarterback ranking in the league. This is the week where Aaron Rodgers goes to number one. Josh Allen moved up into the top three. It's just a fun little thing I do for myself just to see what other people are saying about quarterbacks. Because to me, quarterbacks are the hardest position to rank. Because, you know, you can have a good game and still... Kirk, Kirk Cousins is my favorite example of this. Where Kirk Cousins for the Minnesota Vikings can have a game where he'll look like a Hall of Fame quarterback. And then he'll have a game where he looks like he's never played football before. You know, tons of interceptions, you know, fumbles, does nothing on offense. And so how do you get a gauge on what kind of quarterback he is? Right? That, that would tell me it averages out to average. It's just when he's really good, he's really good. And when he's really bad, he goes really bad. Uh, and then he has games where he's just mediocre. So it's hard to do. So I read these types of things. But I, I looked up this week. I was interested. Last week, Kyler Murray was ranked 14th. Uh, and he had moved down after that Lions game, uh, that three turnover Lions game. Now he's moved down again another six spots. 
So they're ranking him at number 20. Of course, this is NFL.com. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll actually tweet this out and put it on Facebook uh, this afternoon at some point uh, where, um, you know, just for you guys that uh, care about it and, and want to look on it. Incidentally enough, Teddy Bridgewater is right behind him. He moved up five spots to 21, right? And they just played each other. I mean, 2020 stats for Kyler Murray. Uh, they have him ranked 20. Four games, of course, 68.8%. Uh, completed passes, 919 pass yards, 6.4 yards per average, seven passing touchdowns, five interceptions. Of course, three of those were in one game. 265 rushing yards, which is a lot of rushing yards, and he's been good doing it as well. Four rushing touchdowns, and then the one fumble loss that we just talked about. But here's what they say about Kyler Murray here in this little uh, write-up this week. And it kind of caught my eye a little bit. The other ones have been, you know, un un unimaginative. Uh, you know, after the first two weeks, they said he's on the up and coming. He's going to be an MVP candidate, you know, soon. Uh, he's, he's a stellar quarterback. This is what they're saying now after one really bad performance against the Lions and then a mediocre performance against the Panthers this week. He says every year there's a player who represents a dead giveaway as to who's watching the games and who's simply gorging on highlights. Anyone adding Murray to the premature MVP discussion can be summarily dismissed. As dangerous as Murray has been as a runner this season, he's been equally disappointing as a passer. He remains one of the least effective quarterbacks in intermediate throws, that means 10 to 20 yards, an issue going back to last season. And this hit me kind of a little bit because I've been on the Kyler Murray's a great, going to be a great quarterback in this league. Uh, he has issues where he throws across his body. I didn't even pick up on the fact that he struggles on his intermediate throws. Those are the throws that get you places. Those are the throws that get you out of trouble. Those are the plays that get you those easy first downs as you're going down the field. And he is not effective at those throws. And that's alarming uh, in that spot there. That's just something I'm going to keep an eye on for the next few weeks, probably the rest of this season. And pay attention to those short throws. We all know he can flare it out to the running back. We've seen him do that. We know that he can flare it out uh, short to D-Hop. We know he can go deep to D-Hop right? or any of the other receivers. That intermediate one is his lacking point there. And we need to see improvement on that. So I'm going to pay attention to that. It kind of hit me when I read that. And it was like, you know what? That's not bad. And I started looking it up. And it's exactly right. That's a struggling point. And that's where your bread and butter is made as a quarterback. Quarterbacks that are really good can hit those little flare out 10 yard passes uh, to people and get the chains moving uh, as you move on. I mean, watch a Green Bay game with Aaron Rodgers. Watch a Drew Brees game. Those guys stick out because they can hit those those passes and keep the chains moving. One thing that we've talked about in the past is last week, Larry Fitzgerald had one catch for zero yards. This week, two catches for four yards, had three targets. So D Hop continues, even with his bum ankle, he continues to be have to be the most targets. He had nine this week. He had seven catches for 41 yards. Dan Arnold has come out as a pretty good uh, target tight end, and he's looking for him a lot. He had four targets, but four receptions for 39 yards for uh, Dan Arnold. Uh, Chase Edmonds uh, had six targets uh, on the passing game. Christian Kirk three for 19 with five catch uh, five targets. Larry was two for four, four yards for Larry and three targets. This kind of goes to, of course, Andy Isabella that had a breakout game but against the Lions when Christian Kirk was out. Two receptions for three yards with three targets. But after reading that stat, this kind of sticks out a little bit. DeAndre Hopkins is the leader in the catching, right? And he's targeting him the most. Uh, and he's, he's getting him downfield a little bit more. And when he's getting him underneath, he's running it down. Dan Arnold, same thing as a tight end. A little bit closer of a receiver uh, on there. But after that, Christian Kirk, uh, no catches. Larry Fitzgerald's the slot guy. He's the guy that's in that 10 to 20 uh, range window on the passing plays. He's not hitting him. He's not even looking at him. Just something to watch there after I read that NFL.com uh, paragraph regarding uh, Kyler Murray that I just, uh, I'm going to watch the rest of this year and see, I, I've completely missed that. I, I Same thing. I fell victim. Not that I watched the highlights only like they said. I do watch the games. And he's definitely got problems in areas. But, you know, not that we shouldn't be high on Kyler Murray, but, you know, this is something that we need to see improvement on in this Cardinals offense. Uh, keep those chains moving and move forward uh, on that good stuff. So, anyway, 
uh, something to look forward to on that about Kyler Murray. Not bagging on him. I don't think he's the worst quarterback ever. I don't think they should get rid of him. He's definitely an up-and-coming quarterback still, but this is definitely an area I'd like to see the improvement come from, from Kyler Murray. So let's move on from last week's dreadful game. Hopefully, we're going to see a better game this week. Cardinals go to New York, MetLife Stadium. First thing I'd like to say is, 49ers went in there with a lot of injuries when they play the Jets one week and the Giants the next week. We've seen a couple other big injuries from guys. Make sure your cleats are right when you get into MetLife Stadium, Cardinals. Make sure you're ready for that turf. The big key in this game is no major leg injuries. No knees blowing out, no ankles, no broken legs, anything like that in this game. Make sure we're properly prepared going into this game. Let's get out of this game healthy first and foremost uh, for the Cardinals this week. Of course, the Cardinals are 2-2 two and two going into this game. The New York Jets are 0-4. Not only are the Jets 0-4, they are the only NFL ranked team or only NFL team ranked bottom three in points per game, which is 16.3 is all they're scoring, and points per game is allowed, 32.8 this season. Here's the thing that we're... So right off the bat, all week long, it's like, oh, Cardinals have a good uh, team to go up against. Work out some of these kinks. Even if they don't come in there and dominate this game uh, like they should, even if they struggle a little bit with this 10 a.m. kickoff on Sunday, they should still win this game just talent-wise, right? Uh, but here's the caveat. Joe Flacco is starting as quarterback instead of Sam Darnold. And I said this on Wednesday night's radio show. Uh, don't be on 15 of the Fanatic. I'm not saying the Jets are going to win this game. I'm just saying this game is going to be closer than you think it's going to be. You don't know what you're going to get from Joe Flacco. You're not going to get the Super Bowl winning Joe Flacco by any stretch. But he's healthy now. He's been on injured reserve. Uh, he has the ability to take whatever garbage play Adam Gase is giving him that Sam Darnold can't do anything with. And he's got the ability to make something happen on it. He's got the experience to do it. And that's a little worrisome, especially with the way Kennard's been ruled out for this game. I saw a little bit ago, uh, definitely out. Are we going to get a pass rush on him? Are we going to get to the quarterback at all uh, to take the pressure off the safeties? Uh, yes, Buda Baker's back this week. Banjo's been practicing, but we don't know about his status yet uh, on there. So take the pressure off the secondary with Flacco there. So that way, uh, by getting to uh, Flacco and hitting him. Simple at that point. One quick thing on this game is uh, this morning, I'm doing this uh, podcast on Friday here. Uh, the uh, Jets play, I, I waited a little bit longer just to see uh, injury-wise on this week. Normally, I record on Thursday afternoon. So, Jets player did test positive for COVID this morning. So, they Jets shut down the practice facility. Everybody went home like they're supposed to do. Everything did everything properly there. They tested the players again. All the testing is done for the East Coast teams at a facility down the road from the Jets. I mean, it's literally not too far from the Jets facility. And they were able to get the test back into them today, and they got the results back. Right before I recorded, I saw a retweet saying that the second test on the player that did test positive overnight, it has reportedly come back negative on that player. So this game looks like it's going to go. This game was going to go even if he was the only player that went positive. This game was still going to go. It's, they, they stop the games when there's a big breakout, obviously, on there. They do the contract contact tracing and everything. So it looks like the game's going to go. So that's why I kind of washed over if this game's going to go or not. That was a big story yesterday and earlier today as well. So Jets are 32nd on offense. Their offense is atrocious. I expect it to be a little bit better with Flacco there, like I said uh, just a few minutes ago, because I think he can do things with Adam Gase's god-awful offense that he puts in there. I think he'll be able to do things that Sam Darnold can't do just from his experience. I expect him to have a better than they have been offensive day. I don't expect as many three and outs. Let's put it that way. The Jets' pass defense is ranked 32nd in the league. They can't stop anybody, which scares me. The rush defense is 26th in the league. Here's what scares me about this. I just got done talking about how the Cliff Kingsbury likes to throw the ball. I just got done talking about how the uh, Kyler Murray is one of the worst quarterbacks in that short intermediate range. Being that the Jets pass defense is 32nd in the league, I can see this just being a pass fest. 
clock not winding down like it should. Just Cardinals trying to throw the ball everywhere. When they're ranked 26 defense, run the ball. Let's take the let's take the time down as we go as we move the ball down the down the field. And that's what scares me a little bit about this is just Cardinals having short drives like we talked about in the in the game when we broke it down. Cardinals having short drives, Cardinals having short uh, time drives, getting their defense out there for long periods because they just want to throw the ball everywhere instead of running it with Kenyon Drake. And let's see what the running backs can do. Let's do it. What's the harm on it? See what happens, right? Frank Gore is going to be starting a running back. I was reading that Le'Veon Bell is back at practice because he's been on the IR, I think, with his hamstring. He's eligible to come off it. He's been practicing, but they have a couple weeks before they have to remove him from it. And as of this recording, I haven't seen any indication that he's going to come off before this game. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but at least we'll, we'll see Frank Gore as a receiver, as a running back, excuse me, uh, for the uh, Jets here. So here's my take on this game. Game is going to be closer than what most think it will be. I've seen a lot of people saying it's going to be like 30 to 10. Things like that. I think it's going to be a little bit closer. Many factors. Cardinals don't play well at 10 a.m. Cardinals are coming off two bad, bad games. Offensively. We're not, we're seeing too much cuteness on the offense. We're not seeing a domination taking the clock down, taking the ball away from the other team. Um, they're playing... You know, with the uncertainty, I know it didn't really affect much too much, but everybody woke up this morning with this COVID deal. So that now factors in just a little bit, even though they don't go uh, on there. Um, Flacco starting his first start in a very long time. Gosh, at least a year, right? Um, he's coming off of that injury. He's rested. Uh, he's ready to go. This is his last chance to do something. He's a Super Bowl winning at cute quarterback with experience. Um, he can... Cards struggle, like I said, with the 10 a.m. games on the East Coast. All that being said, I, I, yeah, there's no... I could have found reasons to pick Carolina last week. I could have found reasons to pick the Lions the week before. We could have found reasons to justify it and pick them, and we wouldn't have been crazy doing so. You're absolutely nuts if you look at this game and think that there's any chance the Jets can win this game. Doesn't mean they can't win it. I'm just saying, looking at it figuratively... And breaking down, looking at everything as a whole, there's zero chance the Jets can win this game on paper. It's that simple. There's no way you can pick the Jets in this game and believe they're going to win. It's just, that would be more of like a I hope they win type of a deal. And the Jets coming into this game should be mismatched. I have a 28-21 Cardinals victory this week over the Jets. I think the team's going to look better than you think they're going to look. The Cardinals will. They're going to rebound pretty nice. But it's also going to be a false better because of who they are playing and how bad the Jets are at the 0-4 spot. This is a case of this isn't the case of the 0-2 Lions coming into town and me saying and during that podcast that the Lions are better than their 0-2 record says. This isn't the case of the Jets are better than the 0-4 record sound. If the Jets could be more than 0-4 after four games, they would be. They have been that bad. So let's go Cardinals. Of course, you can reach me at SMAC500 on, on all the socials. Uh, of course, at the main event pod, I'll get this uh, obviously posted up. We'll get it in uh, podcast form as well for everybody. Thank you for watching the main event po special podcast, Cardinals Rewind. Of course, I'm Stephen McCollum. Definitely let me know your thoughts on the game as well as your thoughts on the podcast. I appreciate any feedback, positive, negative. Let me know your thoughts uh, out there. I try to bring something a little bit different as a Cardinals fan than you hear on the radio and things like that. So definitely uh, let me know if you like what you uh, see and hear on this. So we'll see you next week uh, for week six. We'll, of course, review the Jets game. I'll be honest with you. I don't know who the Cardinals play that week. I haven't looked that far ahead in the schedule. I'm concentrating on this Jets game because it's very important. The Cardinals go to 3-2 and two after this game, and they improve. They use this game to improve on a lot of things and, and dominate this game. So there's no talk of anything other than the Cardinals' next game in Week 6. So we will see you all next week, and go Cardinals!